I'm going to have you uh, turn once again. I'm going to begin with uh, John 15, too, again. The Lord won't let me leave John 15. And so I'm going back, and I am looking at verse 2 of chapter 15. Let me just read a couple of uh, the first two verses anyway, or three. Jesus speaking, he says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman or the vine keeper. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth or pruneth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean, really purged, pruned through the word which I have spoken unto you. I want to take a moment and uh, look to the Lord in the word of prayer. And then uh, we will probably jump over to Romans chapter 8 uh, for some further thoughts on pruning. God's pruning us if we're his branches. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you're the, you're the master pruner. <laughs> you're the master vine keeper. We can completely trust our life, our branches, into your care. You know just what to snip away and what to leave. We thank you for that. We pray that as we look into your word and think along these lines tonight, that you'd make it profitable to us, but Lord, glorifying to you. This is the end purpose. We thank you for who you are. We've sung about you, and our hearts have rejoiced in the words of the songs as we reflect upon who you are and uh, what you've done and what you've promised. We praise you for it all. Now, Lord, have your way. Work your will in us through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I've already mentioned that the natural tendency of a grapevine is to grow and to grow vigorously. And because of that, the grapevine becomes, the branches of it become so dense. Because what happens is, off of the branches of the grapevine, a whole bunch of shoots are always shooting out, growing off of it. And those shoots on the branches will hinder the production of grapes. In fact, as a grapevine, I'm told this, as a grapevine ages, and they live, they live long like trees. They live a long time. As a grapevine ages, it becomes more important to prune it because it puts out more shoots than ever before. And so as a grapevine ages, it's necessary to more intensely prune it so that you have a maximum grape yield. You have to cut away those shoots more and more each year. I don't know if, if you were here last week or if you heard the message, but what I was saying is that like a grapevine that is always putting out these really unnecessary shoots off the branches, the default setting of human life is that we put off, we always are sprouting new shoots in our self-life, the self-life. And when I talk about the self-life, I'm talking about the unnecessary rampant growth that naturally happens in our lives that stems from our flesh that hinders the Holy Spirit's production of the fruit of the Spirit in us. So God, he has to intervene. And that's what he's talking about in verse 2. God intervenes in the Christian life, and the way he does so is he cuts back, he cuts away the self-life. And if you're serious as a believer about more spiritual fruit production in your life, a more fruitful Christian life, then God is going to trim you down and God is going to shear off the stuff in your life 
at a much deeper level in your soul than perhaps another Christian. If you're serious about a fruitful Christian life. In fact, I remember years ago picking up a, a gospel pamphlet for Christians, uh, and the title was it, Others May, You Cannot. And the whole gist of that pamphlet was, if you're a serious Christian and you want a fruitful Christian life, other Christians may be able to do stuff and get away with it, but if you're serious about a fruitful life, and I don't know about you, but I am. I, I want a fruitful Christian life, especially the older I get, the more I see how, ne how necessary that is because my fruit-bearing days are, are being trimmed down. And, and so I want to be as fruitful as I can in whatever time I have left. And if you want a fruitful Christian life, if you're serious about your Christian life, then you're going to undergo what we might say is mature pruning. That is intensity. God with intensity will cut with his pruning knife close to the core of who you are. Now, if you're not worried about fruitful Christian life, if, it, if the Christian life is a casual thing to you, well, you know, close your ears. Uh, because I'm speaking about people that care about a spiritual fruitful life. I asked you, or I think I mentioned, that we'd be going over to Romans chapter 8. Because in Romans chapter 8, I was reading there recently, and it really occurred to me that what Romans 8 is all about is spiritual fruitfulness. It's about spiritual fruitfulness. Did you know that uh, up until Romans chapter 8, the first uh, seven chapters in the book of Romans, I think the Holy Spirit is mentioned one time. But when you get to chapter 8, the Holy Spirit in chapter 8 is mentioned like 19 or 20 times. Chapter 8 is about a spiritually fruitful life. Look, that's the aim of God for every Christian. That's God's purpose. That's God's intention for your life and mine. If you're a blood-bought believer, God wants you to be fruitful. That's his aim. His intention. And so he is going to, he's gonna, he's gonna make room for additional spiritual production in your life, for additional spiritual fruit to be produced in your life. How does he do that? And you know what another term for that is? Sanctify. He sanctifies us. I want you to look with me at verse 29. In verse 29. Uh, we are told, for whom he, God, did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. The word conformed in verse 29 is a word that simply means that we would have the same form as Jesus, that we would be fashioned to look like Jesus, not physically, but spiritually, that you would be a complete Christ imager. You know, when we were created, God created human beings in his own image. And sin messed up the image. Sin marred the image. Sin muddied the waters. And so what salvation does what God intends to do, God's intention, God's aim is to sanctify believers, that is to make us complete Christ imagers. And the way he does that is through deep and deeper pruning, spiritual pruning of these lives that are called branches in uh, John 15 too. And the way that he prunes is through various tests and sufferings that challenges you and I to surrender something of great value to God. Things that he wants you to surrender to him that perhaps you have every right not to. You have every right to hold on to. They're not wrong. But God wants to spiritually 
stretch your limits farther than they've ever been stretched in your past testings. Each trial, look at it this way. Every single trial that enters your life is an opportunity for you and I to let God work in you to produce more fruitfulness. And did you know that's what the 28th verse is really talking about? That famous verse, we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That's what that verse is talking about, more fruitfulness. Letting everything that God allows into our life work more spiritual fruitfulness in us. See, that's God's aim, to sanctify us, which means to make us spiritually fruitful. But I want you to remember that, as I mentioned, the Holy Spirit is brought to uh, our focus over and over in Romans 8, because to sanctify, we need a sanctifier. And the sanctifier is the Holy Spirit of God. And you know what the Lord showed me recently that I never have seen before? You know how many times I've read Romans chapter 8 over? I mean, I haven't counted them, but hundreds of times. But I noticed something recently that I had never put together before when I saw that this 8th chapter is about spiritual fruitfulness. In Romans 8 verse 26, we read this. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our weakness. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit, literally himself, maketh intercession, prays for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts, that's God, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he, the Holy Spirit, praise or makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know what I realized? I always looked at those two verses as simply saying that we don't know uh, how to pray for ourselves adequately. And so the Holy Spirit undertakes for us and he prays in our place. And that's true. That's what the verses are saying. But you know what he's praying for? He's praying for our sanctification because he's the sanctifier. What is he praying in us for? It's the Holy Spirit in you praying for you to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what he's praying. That's what he's pleading. He's pleading for you in harmony with God's will that you would be sanctified. And he's doing it in, 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 in a way that it cannot even be verbalized. It's the heart of God to the heart of God. Sanctify them, Father, by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And the Holy Spirit, he's the author of the truth. He's the author of the word. And he's praying for our sanctification, that we would be the same form conformed to Christ's image. Isn't that amazing? That's God's aim. Spiritual productiveness that we be sanctified. The Holy Spirit is a sanctifier. <laughs> and here's the, here's the kicker. It's not going to happen just because the Holy Spirit prays for you. Because God never forces the human will. Oh, he puts pressure on it. But he never makes us do anything that we don't want to do. And so there is... There is this aim to sanctify. The Holy Spirit is a sanctifier, but there's a setback. God's for you and me. And in this eighth chapter, what we read is nothing in external circumstances can stop God's plan. Listen to it. Verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who or what can be against us? Drop down in that same chapter, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes through a list of external circumstances. Tribulation being the first. Verse 38. I am persuaded, neither life, death, angels, principalities, power, nor things uh, present, things to come, 
height, verse 39, depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What's he saying? He's saying there is absolutely nothing, no external circumstance, even the devil and the demons themselves have no ability to stop God's plan of sanctifying you. He said that in verse 30. He said, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, he also justified, whom he justified, he also glorified. It's already a done deal in the mind of God. Those are past tense, even though some of them haven't happened yet. I haven't been glorified yet, have you? And yet it's a done deal. And, and But the setback is there's only one thing that is able to set back the sanctifying spirit of God. You know what it is? Your will. It's your self-life. It's your will. That is, the reason God, through trials, prunes our lives is he's pruning your self-life at the deepest level in your soul so that you change your attitude about trials, so you change your thinking about them, so that you change your desires, and ultimately, your will changes so that you choose God and his will over your own will. And that's the way that you're conformed to be a complete Christ imager. You're conformed from being carnal-minded to being spiritually-minded, which is what he talks about earlier on in chapter 8, I think, verse 5 through 8. So you're really the key to your sanctification. It's a personal choice. You can either cooperate with the Spirit of God, who's the sanctifier, or you can cause a setback. You can cause a setback and you can live a carnal life as a believer and be spiritually unproductive, but he still is going to seek to prune you. He prunes every branch, but he prunes people that want spiritual, uh, greater spiritual fruit production. He prunes them at a deeper, mature level. There's a second thing. And for this, I want to go over for a moment to Philippians chapter 3. That's God's aim. Here's something that when we talk about the pruning that God is doing in our life, there's something that has to be acknowledged. And Paul acknowledges it in Philippians 3 and verses 12 and 13. He says, now, I haven't attained. I'm not perfect yet. But you know what I do? I'm following after. I'm seeking to lay hold of Christ more and more. He says, I don't, I haven't apprehended. I haven't reached that pinnacle yet of spiritual fruitfulness. But this one thing I do, he says, what's he acknowledging there? He's acknowledging that he hasn't arrived. He's not at the climax of spiritual fruitfulness. The Apostle Paul, he's being honest. He hasn't arrived. I haven't apprehended. You know, <clears throat> I don't know about you. I don't want to talk about myself. You have your problems. I have my problems. But uh, one thing that uh, I, I have to deal with on a regular basis is chronic sinus problems, okay? And sometimes, you know, like when I go for an annual physical, they always check my sinuses and, you know, they push air. Does that hurt? Does that hurt? How about there? How about there, you know, and they're they're touching all these these places to see if there's pain in the in the area where the sinuses are. And uh, so. One thing that I think we need to acknowledge. Is, yes, we haven't arrived. But in the process of arriving, it's painful. Pruning is painful. When God prunes you, you're going to have pain in specific places in your life. There's going to be pain like when that doctor presses this area <clears throat> where there's sinus pressure and you can feel a little pain there. There's going to be pain when God takes that pruning knife to your life 
at the spot where the knife is cutting something away. And if you ever wonder where God is pruning you, then ask yourself, where is it that you're hurt? Is it in your marriage? Is it in your family life? Is it in your friendships? Does it, is it in your job or your housing? I mean, you name it. There are areas in which you feel pain, and very clearly, the Lord is pruning you in those areas. So acknowledge, first of all, yeah, I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived. I, I, I'm not spiritually as fruitful as God wants me to be. And it's painful, this pruning process, but all also acknowledge the fact that this pruning is purposeful that God's permitted your situation, whatever it is, and he's kept you and I in this broken world that we're in. And guess what? He has us just where he wants us so that he can complete the work that he has begun in us. God hasn't, and he never will abandon you. He'll never leave you. But he's present with you in your painfulness in your painful circumstances, because he's seeking to make you Christ-like, seeking to conform you into that complete Christ imager. And so the vine keeper's knife is at work shaping you, directing you, strengthening you for that season when you will bear more fruit that may not be visible now, but it will be in the future. Um, it's on the way. <clears throat> and then a third and final thing I wanted to say about God's pruning. Also, I, I'm still in Philippians 3. Not only is, again, we know what God's aim is. There are some things we just acknowledge in this pruning process. But the third thing, the areas of pruning. The areas of pruning. God is deepening his pruning process in believers that are serious about spiritual fruit. God's deepest, maturest pruning is taking place. God, God's way is really to prune you, to help you make him your number one pursuit in life. God is always pruning things that we seek first, things that we love the most, things that we hate giving up. He's pruning, he's cutting them back, cutting them away so that you can pursue your true desire, which is Jesus and his kingdom. Notice what he says in chapter three and verse 10. Well, let's go back a moment. In verse eight, at seven, he says, what things were gained to me, I count loss. Look at the thing. Uh, we don't have time to read them all. But uh, beginning in uh, verse four, down through verse six, Paul lists a whole bunch of things that he had in his self-life. A lot of them were really impressive. But he comes to the point where he realized, you know what? God's pruned all of those out of my life, and they're nothing to me. I count them as nothing, loss. He says in verse 8, I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, of whom I've suffered the loss of all things. I count them but dung. They're manure. It's a manure pile, as far as I'm concerned. All that stuff that I used to live for, that, that was my identity, that used to be what I was about, it's all dung that I might win Christ, that I might know him, that he might be my number one pursuit. Verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Here's the pruning and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, that by any means I might attain to the or take hold of the resurrection of the dead. Pruning that goes way beyond just rearranging your priorities in life. It goes to the heart of what defines you as a person. That is, the people that you love, 
the possessions that you cling to, the things that you demand to do, your deep sense of protecting your personal rights. So these are the areas where the pruning knife in those that, again, want that mature pruning to happen in their life. Here's where the knife's going to cut. You ready? It's going to cut in the area of the people that you love. A fiance, your spouse, your children. God comes to you and he, you have to come to the place where you're willing to say goodbye to them and give them to God. He's the owner. I don't own my wife. I don't own my kids. They're yours. I put them in your hands. I remember the day when God challenged me on that, when I was just a young pastor, and God said, what if I took your wife and children right now? Would you still serve me? I remember I put them on the altar. God challenged, God cut deep. He cuts the, he wants us to recognize we're not the owners of anything, including the people that we love, and that we release them to him and follow God's will, even when it means defying close family members to do the will of God. I know my wife had that. Her, I don't think that her parents and her family were too happy that she was marrying a poor preacher. You know, uh, I, I, I remember my father-in-law was concerned because I was in the, in, an independent pastor and I didn't have any denomination that I could get a retirement account with. I remember him bringing that up and, you know, and sometimes you just have to, you have to defy even your closest family members to do the will of God. Here's a second area where the, the, Deep, mature pruning for more fruit takes place. Not only the people you love, but your rights. What you say are your personal rights. You know, it is inherent in human beings to think that we deserve certain rights. I have a right to be married. I have a right to have children. I have a right to achieve some particular kind of success in my life. I have a right to own certain things. I have a right to know why God does some things. Why, Lord? How long, Lord? God is going to prune you in that area of your own personal rights. If you're going to be spiritually fruitful, God's going to, God is going to deal with you, and you're going to have to recognize that when you got saved, you surrendered all your rights. You don't have any rights. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You're a slave. And slaves have no rights. You're a slave of Jesus Christ. And so surrender your rights. You did that at salvation. Didn't you realize that? Why are you still defending your personal rights? They're, you don't have any. You've given them over to Jesus to do with you and in your life and through your life, whatever he chooses. Surrender your rights because you don't really have any, truth be told. Third area where there is mature, deep pruning in the life is in the area of your love of money and possessions. Being able to let go of possessions and material comforts. It's a long process. It's a lifelong process, this thing. And our, you don't realize it, and you probably don't want to admit it. I know I don't. We have a servitude to money and possessions that we give because it demands our energies. It demands our, uh, our time and our loyalties. And boy, we, we hand it over for money and possessions. How much of what you call yours has God asked you for? And then how much of that have you given what he's asked for? There's a fourth area, and then I'll be done. 
And that is, he's going to deeply cut and prune in your source of, uh, of significance. Every human being, and I believe God puts this in us, every human being has a, has a God-given need for a sense of worth and purpose in life. For Abraham, it was Isaac. And for Moses, it was the riches of Egypt. For Paul, it was his heritage that he mentioned in verses 4 through 6 of Philippians 3. What is it for you? Is it your life dream? Anything that God prunes from your life, understand this, he always, always gives something of greater value and more significant purpose in your life. Paul was pruned of, uh, of those things mentioned in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 3, but he gained in verses 7 through 10. And it wasn't that God simply reordered his priorities, but he said, this one thing I do. I have one goal in life. I have one desire, one ambition, and that is to pursue Christ, to know him, and uh, to bear fruit for him. We don't have to ask God to prune us. If you're a believer, he's going to prune you. What we need to do, and this is the important thing, is to respond rightly to his pruning in the areas that he is cutting away, seeking to make us spiritually fruitful and productive. 